Welcome to Detoxicity. By men, about men, for everyone. This is a podcast that's attempting to remix the narrative around masculinity, and I thank you for listening and supporting. If you're new to the podcast, I hope you check out the archive, which contains over 150 episodes. I'm always happy when someone reaches out with a friendly word or constructive criticism, so never hesitate to hit me up either via IG at DetoxPodGuy or via email, DetoxPod at gmail.com. You can also contact me if you're interested in being a guest on the show or if you know someone who might be a good guest for the show. Uh, There's also a Detoxicity Patreon. Patrons get episodes one week early, plus I will mail you a cool Detox Pod fridge magnet. Go to bit.ly slash Detox Pod Plus to find out more. Oh, one more thing. Late last year, I completed my certification uh, courses, and I am now a life and relationship coach. I'm taking clients. Go to mike-joseph.com and book a free consultation. Thanks for listening. I really do appreciate you. So... Interestingly, or maybe not so interestingly, I'm going to give you a little insight into how I find guests. Most of the people who are on this show are friends or acquaintances of mine. And it's as simple as me sending an email saying, hey, want to be on the show? Sure. Um, There are a few people who I think have interesting stories and I go after them, uh, usually on social media or via email, uh, that have agreed to be on the show. That is how I've gotten some of the bigger names I've gotten on the show. Um, And every once in a while, someone will reach out to me proactively and say, Hey, I have a story. Uh, I'm really interested in telling it on your show. Or the things I'm interested in uh, align with the things that you're interested in talking about on the podcast. Let's collaborate. And in some cases, it's very pluggy, very salesy, very, I have a book Uh, I have my own podcast, I have whatever, um, and they're really kind of more interested in promoting themselves and actually telling their story, uh, in which case my response is usually to ignore or say no. But once in a while, someone reaches out to me uh, where our interests legitimately align, and we end up having a conversation that turns out to be fantastic, and I just, in a very long way, explained how I ended up on Cameron Mazio who is the person that I'm interviewing for this particular episode of Detoxicity. Uh, Cameron is a licensed clinical social worker and a therapist based in New Jersey. And uh, Cameron has a lot of very interesting perspectives about mental health. Uh, He talks about his own story. And uh, I I really think this is a special conversation. Um, So uh, I hope you uh, buckle up and listen. Uh, Without any further ado... Here is Cameron. So my name is Cameron Mazio. I am a licensed clinical social worker here in New Jersey. I'm also a licensed independent clinical social worker in Massachusetts. Primarily what I do is I have a small private practice that caters specifically to, I'll say, like alternative lifestyles and relationships. So primarily I work with a lot of LGBTQ plus individuals and a lot of polyamorous individuals, a lot of kink positive individuals. I, you know, we do like outpatient therapy. I do assessments. I help write letters for people to get access to therapy or medical treatment. I create trainings and do educational things. I help people figure out how to get their documentation when they're changing their name or their gender. So it's a lot of stuff part of the like primarily queer community and I'm starting to incorporate other therapists who have their own communities that they're interested in in bringing in so I have another therapist who primarily works with men and trying to have men feel comfortable coming into therapy with athletes with teachers so like I said the practice is mostly geared towards alternative communities that aren't typically in mental health treatment or seeking services from us That's mostly what I do in my professional life. In my free time, I do a lot of hobbies. I do a lot of creative hobbies. So I sew a lot of little demon-shaped stuffies. And (laughs) I know, it's such a weird one. Weird stuff, it's cool. (laughs) 
So, so, and I, I just kind of touch into a bunch of different creative places. I've been in the process of learning how to make some or like revamp some old furniture. So that's been kind of a project I've been on. And right now, because I just started this private practice and while I'm good on the therapeutic mental health side, the business side is causing me some stressors, let's say. And so I've also returned back to school. <laughs> so kind of always a moving and a shaking, it feels like. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. You know, I'm a big fan of evolving and, and the movement that comes with evolution. So all good shit. What brought you into the mental health work and what put you, or what, what was the thought process in a starting to go into this work and deciding to sort of gear what you were doing towards the queer community? Yeah. Okay. Well, it kind of starts off really sad, so I apologize for that one. No, this um, podcast has <laughs> definitely has sad moments. So growing up, somewhere in my my early puberty age, somewhere around like 10, 11, 12, I started to have really bad depression, but it was very unwarranted for the life in which I lived. You know, I had two parents who were still together. They were middle class. I Really, I went without nothing. I had my extended family who was actually pretty close. My aunts and uncles lived right around the corner. My grandparents lived in my house. So I was very family connected. I had a lot of friends. I was into sports. My grades were decent. I was definitely not AP course level, but I was like AB student in the average classes. And then all of a sudden, it was just like this severe the pre- depression that sort of hit. And it kind of felt like it was out of nowhere. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense. My parents didn't actually catch it until my mom put two and two together and saw that I had been self-injuring. I'd been cutting myself. Mm. I had sort of gotten away for a long time without her knowing because we had animals, we had cats, and we were always getting a little scratched up. And then one day she kind of was like, you know, it's interesting. You're always cut in the exact same places. It doesn't entirely make sense. I was a deer in headlights and she was just like, oh, there's more here going on. So I went to a psychologist who, you know, he wasn't very attentive, honestly. He was a psychiatrist, psychologist. So I saw him for therapy. I also saw him for medication and it didn't really help. He wasn't very attentive, like I said. And I ended up going to the hospital after my mom uncovered that I was planning to commit suicide. And I mean, full plan, had a beam picked out, had learned how to tie a noose, the whole caboodle had figured the whole thing out. And, you know, she was, of course, devastated. We were very, very close. And I had started acting out in a really weird behavior. Even in my hardest time, I was never really an aggressive or mean person. And all of a sudden I was starting to snap at her and get really nasty. And she's like, all right, something's very off. And I remember in my teenage brain, I was like, listen, I'm doing this because I'm in a lot of pain, but I don't really want the people I care about to hurt. So if I make them really angry and hate me, it won't hurt as much when I'm gone. So like I said, she figured it out. I was hospitalized for a while and the hospital was good in keeping me safe, but they don't really do treatment. And the people there were not really good with LGBTQ plus uh, uh, topics at all at the time. You know, this is the early 2000s. My school didn't have a gay straight alliance. We had tried to put one in because there was a couple of queer kids who were adamant that they wanted to have a space to meet up and to do different programming and stuff. And the school had vehemently voted against it. So we had a group that was the unofficial queer slash, you know, social, it was called the social justice committee. So it was a lot of kids who were persons of color and it was a lot of queer kids kind of coming together to acknowledge the disparities we were experiencing in the education system. But yeah, there just wasn't a whole lot of support out there. So I didn't really 100% understand what I was going through. At that point, when I was hospitalized, I realized that I definitely had an attraction towards women. And it wasn't until I realized that I was transgender and felt comfortable with myself that I realized I also had an attraction towards men. So I had grown up basically a little girl named Larissa Lynn. When, and this is what's going on at the time. I'm a little girl. I'm, well, not a little girl, but I'm, I'm, a, young, I'm a young teenage girl. <laughs> I'm having this severe depression. I'm cutting. I'm thinking about suicide. It's, I'm medicated. I'm going to therapy. 
you know, and it, everything just kind of feels awful at the same time because whose teenage years feel great, honestly. Right, exactly. <laughs> so she eventually finds a social worker in particular, and this was not a social worker who had ever worked with teenagers, had never worked with queer people. Had, her bread and butter was a lot of middle-aged married women who were struggling in marriage, and she she decided to see me on a okay. Day, basically. Uh, it was such a weird scenario. Uh, it was a person that my mom knew, and she just, knowing that it was having a hard time finding me the right care, she's like, in the meantime, while you're looking, Larissa can come here and see me specifically. So after the hospital, I went to go see her. I, I tried a couple other therapists. They didn't work out, and I went to go see her. Her name was Ellen. She was lovely. And it was with Ellen that I realized that I was trans. And Ellen, having had no experience in this realm, basically said, Okay. And then just did a bunch of research and would come in with all her research. And I remember being t- taken aback about how much she was working to try to meet me halfway. You know, she was just like, I found this article. Let's read it together. I read this about this thing. Here's the parts I'm not really comfortable with, or I don't really understand well enough to help you with, but how can I help you come out? How do I help you tell your story? Right. I had learned that I was trans because I did something called dual enrollment. So like I said, my grades weren't terrible, but I wasn't like an AP course student. So my junior year of high school, I was able to do some kind of testing and they let me go to college part-time and high school part-time. And while I was there, I got a girlfriend and she was one of my longest term girlfriends at the time. And she was a couple of years older, but we were both really introverted. So we started going to there. Like they had an on-campus queer club and the person who was the advisor was lovely because he kept bringing adults in from different settings to come talk about their experiences and i will never forget there was a trans woman who came in her name was akasha and she told me like it was just the the most horrendous story i'd ever heard she was severely abused as a child and was homeless for a while and back alley botox and just a really hard story But I remember when she was talking about growing up and the way she felt, interacting with her siblings and her cousins, I was just like, that's how I feel, just in reverse, you know? And that's when I brought it to Ellen's attention and we kind of worked it out. And I eventually, when I turned 18, came out to everyone. And I had a surprisingly easy time. I think the hardest person, the person it hit the hardest was my dad. And probably the second hardest was my sister. I have a sister who's about six years younger than me. She was still trying to figure out her way in the world, and she has since turned around her thinking. But at the time, she was just like, I love you, and I don't agree with this. You know, Mm -hmm. like those are the two things that are happening. My dad had grown up in Argentina, and that's where he was born, and he came over when he was 13. And so he had this very cookie cutter view of how he wanted his life to be. And I never fit that even from the time I was little. Like I was a little girl who was really into sports and rough and tumble and playing in the mud. And he was really kind of hoping for a more demure kind of character. Exactly. And I just, I was always not a girly girl. Actually, a client said this to me and I loved it so much. I was a tomboy, but I preferred to be a boy named Tom. You know, like. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) So, and I, I was wrestling kids and i was playing in the mud and slide tackling and soccer and like that it was always sort of my my role and it's funny because looking at my family i sort of fit directly in the center of my cousin i have a cousin who's two years older and a cousin who's about six months younger than me and she wasn't hyper feminine but she was still more more feminine than i was and he was obviously more masculine and i sort of was able to play with both of them really really well like i could play barbies or ninja turtles and i was in it (laughs) right on uh but anyway i so 18 i realized that i'm trans i've come out to people my dad is this he took takes a couple years to really get comfortable with it but the rest of my family they're just like they're on it they're supportive they're trying to show me support every way they can which is lovely not what i was expecting seriously (laughs) um my friends took it really in stride i'm still friends with those friends since i was like 15 i i remember coming out i was at one one friend's house we stepped outside i was i was a smoker at the time so i stepped out to have a cigarette my best friend came to follow me and i told her i realized that i'm trans i'm gonna want to transition so she's asking really educated questions like what is that going to mean how is that going to affect your health you know i love you to death i'm not i'm not going anywhere i'm just curious 
and the friend's house who we were at, who's another really good friend of mine. I was in both of their wedding parties. This house we were at came outside like, are you guys coming in? We we're waiting to start the movie. And my best friend was just like, oh, Larissa just told me that she's trans. And we're kind of talking that through a little bit. And I look at the friend who just come outside and she's just like, yeah, that's cool. But we're waiting to start a movie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how they, they've always been uh you know one's just like I, I don't care as long as you're a good person and the other person's like all right i'm gonna ask a little bit more questions so i never lost any friends everything went really well it was a couple of years before i could actually transition not because of um anything to do with nothing to do with my identity or anything like that i wasn't hesitant it was more like there weren't a lot of resources out there i didn't know how to find anything so Anyway, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to go to college for. There was this pressure for me to attend college full-time, do my thing, and I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I had grown up wanting to become a veterinarian and help animals, and when I was like 16 or so, I realized I didn't want to be a vet, not because I didn't love animals, but because vets don't just sit around playing with puppies all day. They yeah. <laughs> have they to go deal with the parents and have to put the animals down when yeah. the parents can't afford to take care of them and i'm like i don't really want to do that not my thing <laughs> totally get that so my the therapist who would help me process and come out was like what is it that you like doing and i'm like you know i really like talking about the queer experience i like talking about being gay i like trying to find ways to to bring the the queer people i know into their own impairment and power not that i was like right at it at the time but that was the thing i loved talking about the disparities and figuring out the history and all these things and she's like it sounds like you want to be a social worker and i was just like oh, that's it i'm going to be a social worker i'm going to be the therapist that i couldn't find i'm going to be the person who gets you to the resources i'm going to be like all these things that i needed when i was in this tumultuous stage so it kind of led to the ultimate goal, which was to have my private practice that was specifically for LGBTQ teens. And then as I grew and went through college and met new people, I realized I, while LGBTQ stuff was definitely still the basis of it, there was other parts to the community that still needed help. It was people who were in the kink community who would go seeking help for OCD and people were like, yeah, but you, you know, like beating people. We should talk about that. No, that's not, that's a consensual thing. It's yep. not the reason I'm here. Yep. Or like people who are in these ethical non-monogamous relationships sort of being told that their world, their lifestyle is the reason for all the struggles they're experiencing, which is not really the case. So it's my idea of starting with LGBT sort of expanded to these other communities that sort of were going without resources, without help. And even when I started the practice and I was trying to bring on another therapist, the, the guy who's working with me, his name is Tom. He's lovely. Uh, he's, he's a high school teacher who just is working towards his clinical hours and he's just phenomenal. He's so good at his job. Was talking about other communities I hadn't even thought about, like men and athletes who were under serious stressors and pressure to be a certain thing and don't have those resources either to to deal with the, the stuff going on and that was his passion and i was like you know what i want to give you the place to do that too because i might not know as well about that but you do and that's that's a huge population i didn't even think about that i want to be able to help so it, it's sort of forming into this own thing where we're definitely focusing on communities that go kind of underrepresented in the mental health field and a lot of the research. But it's it's been something of like a, a fun journey and all these kind of weird things just kind of come into our realm as a result. So I've had a couple of companies that were like medical professionals asked me to do trainings on working with bi bi non-binary clients or trans clients. I've had people have me come do education to their employees about how to use the right pronouns. We just got contacted by a college to possibly be on retainer for students who are athletes and having a crisis. So things I never thought I would be part of are now sort of like on my door. So it's That's been a amazing. very cool experience. Yeah. I mean, to, to be able to have all of those opportunities has got to be a very gratifying thing for you. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I would also imagine that by expanding your offering, right? And by having a foot in all of these different worlds, like all of these different sort of, you know, I come from music, so I'm going to say subgenres. It expands your worldview as well and kind of puts you more in tune with yourself. I talk about, I don't talk about, people ask me about this podcast a lot and even the coaching work that I'm starting to do. And they're like, why do you do it? I'm like, there is a part of me that is magnanimous and wants to help other people. But talking to people and understanding the stories of other people and how they got to where they are helps me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I I would say that there's a number of times where I am sitting with a client who is working through something and I realize, oh, my God, I'm working through that exact same thing right now. Yeah. And no, I didn't even realize that, that I'm still working on that thing myself. And I find that having the experience of both sitting with them in their stuff makes it easier for me to sit in with myself through my stuff as well. I mean, it's not the main goal, but that is definitely a small part of it. You know, the other part of it is a lot of the people I work with are people who get so excited to be with someone who just takes their word very seriously. It's a number of times where I have teens who like people have been talking at them for a number of years and they've never had someone just take them at their word as what they're feeling and what they're going through is real right? and talk it through with them. I had a brand new client who was just coming in for an assessment so that they can get a letter to, to do their transition. And they said to me, and I, it was, it was so heartbreaking, but they kind of said to me, you're the first transgender person I've met. Who's like an adult who's actually sat and talked with me. <laughs> my my partner who's non-binary says that I am a trans elder in some way and sometimes my existence in some fashion gives hope to people who are just starting this journey absolutely. and that has always been really nice to hear absolutely I, I do think that even though there are so many more opportunities for queer people and gender non-binary people uh, gender queer people poly people whatever, like all of those people, there's so much more representation now than there was 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago when I was a kid. And having that representation is great. But what's equally important or probably more important is real world representation, like 3D representation. Like it's yes. one thing to go on, you know, social media or TikTok or whatever and see all of these different flavors of, of diversity represented. But actually knowing queer people, actually befriending people who are across the gender spectrum, people who have alternative relationships. And for those of us who are maybe a little bit older, I think it's also important to, to put yourself out there in your truth and, and model behavior so that younger people who are like, oh, you know, I'm feeling this, these feelings, but I'm worried about acceptance and living my life truthfully and all that stuff are like, oh. We know a person in real life that is doing the thing, and this gives us courage to do the thing. Yes. You know, being your your honest, authentic self gives shows other people it's okay to do it for themselves, whatever that means. Yes. Um, so I... It's funny because I, that's literally, so my, my practice is called care counseling and it's C-A-A-R-E and the, and, cause I'm a little bit obnoxious. I will admit I was very, very, I was working with trying to figure out what I was going to name this. I didn't want it to be my name because I, I didn't want it to be all about me, although sure. it's a lot of that, but I wanted it to be something that it will eventually grow into the name that I give it sort of like the name has power in some way. So <laughs> the words that I kept getting stuck with was authentic and autonomous. And I like the idea of having acronyms truthfully. So I created the center for authentic autonomous relationships in existence, counseling and consultation, but right. just to make it easier, it's care counseling and consultation. So no one really knows the reason of the acronym, but the, that's what it came up with is the, I wanted it to be about people being their authentic self and making choices for themselves about how they want to exist in the world and how they want their relationships to look like. Or what That's they amazing. Want their to look like. That is absolutely <laughs> amazing. And I think we need more of that. Um, I, it's interesting to me 
I'm sort of downloading the first part of our conversation that your coming out process was so easy because that's not what I would expect. And obviously you hear the horror stories before you hear the easy stories. Oh, yeah. But I, I, I love that even though this was maybe before there was a bit more representation of non-binary and trans people, that your friends were already so welcoming and accepting of you. Do you think that that's indicative of people in general, or did you just have a really good eye for who to pick as part of your friend base? I think there's a combination of truth, the combination of answers to this. The first one is, I think I got away with a lot primarily because I'm, I'm, you know, my dad, even though he's from Argentina and my grandfather's from Italy, I, I, I grew up in a very Spanish culture, but I honestly hadn't learned a lot of the Spanish culture. My mom is here from America and is multi-ethnic, a bunch of different parts of Europe, basically. Mm -hmm. And so my household was very American, basically. <laughs> there was definitely sprinkles of Italian and Argentine pieces, but I'm very white presenting. I was reasonably attractive, I would say, as, as a girl and even as a guy when I transitioned not trying to toot my own horn. I don't think I'm a model by any stretch. But at, at the same time, I think part of it was that I came from something of a middle class, relatively educated, relatively attractive, white present. I had a lot of privilege. So everyone I sort of interacted with kind of saw me in a way that I think they don't see a lot of my clients, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. On top of that, Argentina by like the the culture of my family happens to be particularly accepting my dad it took him like three years but I think that was just because I did not meet his expectations of what his oldest child was going to look like sure. and when he finally did sort of realize or kind of come around he came around full force in a way that I didn't anticipate so so he has cousins who are here in america that are so close they're kind of like siblings but we all live a little far from each other and one of their kids was graduating and i had not seen that side of the family since i had transitioned and i was passing at this point and i remember he was having a little bit of a panic attack about how he was going to explain this to the people he had grown up with basically his cousins and i remember being like if it would make you feel better i just won't go you know, we had talked about him not really wanting to tell coworkers because he was a director for a company. And he's like, I already know that they're kind of talking shit about me because as a director, as a boss person, and I don't really want to give them that extra fuel. It feels a little bit embarrassing to me. And I was like, listen, that's your realm. It's not my realm. If it was my realm, we would have a different conversation. But you get to come out as a parent of a transgender person however you decide you want to be in the closet about that that's between you and the lord right but this was family that was my family and his family and i was like if it would make you feel better i just won't go and he's like no don't let my issues stop you from being yourself stop you from being with your family like that's ridiculous i still have to get over my issues but they're my issues and i was just like that was probably the most insightful thing i'd ever heard him say holy crap <laughs> people surprise you People do surprise you. I also think that part of the reason I didn't lose any of my friends was because I, I'm late diagnosed ADHD and I seem to kind of gravitate to other neurodiverse people by nature. And so for them, as long as I was genuinely a good person, they didn't really care what I looked like or what I did. I mean, don't get me wrong. They would call me out if they think I'm doing something stupid and they'll tell me to my face, but I liked the fact that, you know, all of my friends are, while we tease each other, we actually do care about how each of us feels. We do really care about our the person that we are. We are really, really good about being honest and sort of upfront, but also setting really good boundaries. And I think that just kind of stems from the fact that I had a group of people who were also either undiagnosed or some version of neurodivergent who they craved that kind of relationship. So they gave that honesty the way I gave that honesty. And so they were pretty good about rolling with the punches. It doesn't mean that we didn't have differences. Like sure. that the one friend had grown up very, very Republican and very conservative. And I was very anxious about telling her. And she's like, listen, my my conservative side comes from my family stemming from like 
the southern part of the country, I had a lot of family who were kind of like proud Confederate like flags in their living room kind of stuff. But even their families, even like we might disagree on a lot of political things, but at the end of the day, they would never disrespect me. And they'd always had full respect and conversations with me. And I sort of learned to not judge people based on on their covers really easily. So I have a number of people who probably would not, like their thought process would probably be not as accepted within my community. But at the same time, I know that they're respectful. I know that they're caring. They just see the world a little bit different, unfortunately. But that doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just different. I respect the level of gracefulness you have towards people. I I think that for some folks growing up with the kind of experience that you've had, and I quite frankly that a lot of queer people have, a lot of non a lot of non white, non straight, you know, non cis, non monogamous people or non non and whatever. Yes. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> monogamous. The experience of encountering resistance from society in general, but also people close to them, it closes them up, it closes them off, it prevents them from being their true selves, and also engenders a lot of bitterness. And you seem like a very non-bitter, you know, a, a welcoming kind of person. And, and that's aspirational, right? <laughs> So I, you know, I think there was a time in which I was a lot more bitter, a lot mm -hmm. more, let's say, confrontational. And I do think that there's a place for that. I don't think I'm not good at that particular uh, stance, but okay. I, I do think that there is a place in the world for those things. And in, in most of the movements that have happened within like the gay rights movement uh, or the women's rights movement, there's always been two fronts. There's been the people who are trying to sort of acclimate into the world and the people who are sort of trying to confront the world as it is. And I am in full belief that both of those things need to exist to see change. It's not one or the other, it's both. Right. And some of my heroes are the people I try to emulate have been people who have, on, on, in a way, learned to befriend the opposite side as a way to show that change is sort of possible. So I, I forget his last name, unfortunately, but there's a there's a guy, I believe he's a blues or jazz player. His name is Daryl. And he's a black man who lives in the southern part of the country. And what he is actually known, well, I mean, yes, his music is amazing, but what he's known for is actually turning KKK members away from the KKK. Oh, really? And, yeah, and that's what makes him so amazing is that I saw him speak once, not in person, but on, online. And he's like, I was playing at a club. After my set, I stepped away and I was having a drink. And a guy came up and was just like, I can't believe how well you play. And he's there bullshitting a little bit. And uh, the guy says to him, like, I, you, no one would believe I'd be talking to you. And he's like, why is that? And the man like puts a card down and he slides it to Daryl. And he found out he was just talking to the grandmaster of the KKK. They, I mean, they were, first of all, I'm like, they have cards? Yeah, apparently. I guess they go to Vistaprint. I have no idea. Oh, good <laughs> <for the> lord. <laughs> so Daryl ends up befriending this guy. And through their, their friendship, the guy starts to kind of see the error in his big thought process. And he talk, and Daryl talks about it very openly. He's like, I'm driving this one guy who's very much a member of the KKK. And the guy, I'm summarizing their thought process yeah. about mine so the guy says something along the lines of like it, you know it's not that i have anything specifically against your personality but as a person who is black you are innately more aggressive it's just science like you guys can't help it it just is what it is and daryl kind of sits there and he's like oh so that must mean that you're a serial killer he's like what and he's like well can you name a single black serial killer and he's just like I uh, he's like, well, I mean, it must be innate in your in your heritage because white people are just always serial killers. Mm -hmm. And the guy's like, well, I've never heard another person in my life. He's like, neither have I. And it wasn't six months later before that guy turns in his hood as well. And so Daryl, if you like Google him, you'll find that he he claims to have turned about 200 
Klan's members away from the KKK. And he's got a closet full of them. They've actually donated their hoods to him. So he's got a closet full of KKK hoods. Jeez. And it's, and it's, it's insane. But there's a part of me that loves that story because he's like, oh yeah, I've gone to their functions. I've stood and watched them set a cross on fire. I've done those things. I've just sat there respectfully watching. And he's like, but what has turned these people away has not been my aggressive, you're wrong and you need to know and you suck. It's just been conversation. Just friendship has turned them away and realized that all their preconceived notions were not accurate and didn't make a lot of sense. There's a TED Talk. I don't remember this girl's name, unfortunately, but have you ever heard of the Westboro Baptist Church? Oh, yeah. So the Westboro Baptist Church is made up of one family, but there's been a couple of members who have basically snuck out in the middle of the night. It's the Phelps family, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fred Phelps. Yeah. yeah. So the one of the younger members does a TED Talk. I forget what her name is. But she basically talked about how she was raised in a family with hate as the basis of their family. It was at the breakfast table. It was at the dinner table. We didn't go to school. We were raised on this hate constantly. We were used to aggressive assaults. We were used to being insulted. We were used to people being angry. And that was never going to break my thought process. It just never could. She goes, I, when I got to like a teenage years, she ended up going online and she was doing her rhetoric basically online and getting the exact expectation that you would assume is just a bunch of people yelling at her and cursing at her and doing all these horrendous things. But there was one or two people who just asked me questions. They didn't threaten me. They didn't say anything. They just talk to me they just ask questions and over a series of time we became pretty good friends and then over some more time they started to see inconsistencies in the things that i was preaching like i would say one thing and then later on say another thing and they didn't align and when i went to my family to ask for explanation because they would point this out they would get angry for me for asking for even asking how these inconsistencies could line up and it got so bad that there was a point in time where i decided i I I didn't want to be part of this family anymore. I started to realize that what we were doing wasn't right and I didn't want to be part of it. And so I escaped with a uh, sibling in the middle of the night with everything I had. Basically, this person who had befriended her online was helping her escape this life, but she had nothing. She had not really an education, no money. And according to her, she ended up staying with a rabbi who she's like, years earlier, I was holding a sign saying that his wife was a whore and he had opened his home and took care of me when I ran away from the family, just lovingly. And now that that friend she's married to happens to be i believe a jewish man if i remember the story correctly and she's a big proponent of the best way to evoke change really is not to wipe out the enemy as much as it is to befriend them and show them that there's a different way to live and i love that i don't think i'm going to ever have as wide an audience as these two individuals but at the same time if i can connect with people and let them see that if the basis is sort of like loving each other in the most human way possible, you know, we'll be able to get through the differences. And I think there's a lot of value in that. You know, I've seen it myself, experienced it myself on you know, both sides of the equation. Uh, I, I think that there are people who have differing capacities to befriend the enemy to simplify the terminology. And I do think that if you have the capacity to speak to these people and do it with grace and patience and tolerance, uh, I think the world needs people like that. Um, The same way the world needs people who are like, let's set this shit on fire. (laughs) Exactly, Um, exactly. You know, Both of them need to exist for change to happen, essentially. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. And I praise people like that because (laughs) their leashes are a lot longer than my leash is. And even as someone who grew up a certain way, and despite my own queerness, was raised, (laughs) and I'm struggling with saying raised homophobic, because there was nothing, no one ever said to me, like, gay people are awful, but, you know, there were always gay jokes. I didn't meet another gay or bisexual, openly gay or bisexual men until I was 
pretty much coming out myself at yeah. 18, 19 years old. So it was like subtle and socialized homophobia rather than aggressive homophobia, but it was homophobia nevertheless. So I've had to change or, or evolve in my thinking. You know, I would have considered myself transphobic and certainly unintelligent about the uh, gender spectrum until I would say probably like 10 or 15 years ago when I met a person who was who was trans and j everybody treated him just like it, they would treat anybody else. And that that experience kind of rang a bell in my head. And I was like, what the hell is going on internally? So I do think that it's sort of like a gentle encouraging exposure can be super helpful in a lot of ways for adjusting the thinking that some folks have. Oh yeah. I, this is part of the reason why I think the presence and the conversation so young are important. So in, in New Jersey, they had passed, I, I forget what the law specifically says, but they had passed a law that said they had to include LGBTQ narrative in education and they were arguing about what time period that would be appropriate i say you can start that as young as physically possible because we don't have to engage the sex or the culture or the sure. history of this we could just start with some families have two mommies and some families have two daddies and that is okay and some families have mommies that are now daddies right and that's okay right. <laughs> like, right. yeah. um, <laughs> you know i think the narrative that some people would like to imagine, or that some people actually do imagine, is that in order to explain to children that there are alter alternative lifestyles, I can't show them porn, it, which is ridiculous. <laughs> and I think, like you said, just a matter of saying, hey, there are people that have two mommies, there are people that have two daddies, there are people that have more than two mommies and daddies. Like It's just letting kids understand like the expansiveness and that they don't have to be one thing. I also think a lot of the rhetoric again. There's some certain certain comments or statements about the way we do education that if everything was equal, they would not agree to. So I'm not a member, but I happen to follow the the Satanist Church out in Salem. I, I visited their place. I have pictures with them. They're awesome. They're su such cool people. But one of the things that they do is they sort of push back on some of that rhetoric to be like, oh, if everything is equal, we're going to include these things. And they find how quickly that people will pull away yeah. their ideas. So it's like they brought Christian coloring books to a particular like kindergarten. So the Satanist church made a, made a Satanist coloring book to bring to the kids. And all of a sudden, no more Christian coloring books, Oops. no more Satanist coloring books. And I'm like, all right, but here's the thing. I don't think it's it's bad or good to include or uh, to exclude any particular thing. I think all of them need to happen. I wish that we had had growing up because I don't know a lot about it, but I wish we had had more conversations about other religions and other ways of life. I wish that I had learned about what the Quran says or Quran. I don't know how to pronounce it. I apologize. You know. uh, <laughs> I wish that, conversation about those holidays had come up as much as conversations around Thanksgiving had happened, which was false narrative anyway. Right. I, I wish we had talked about the way families could look different because my, my first time seeing, I hate to say it this way, my first time having a friend who was Black, we were like 10. I had gone most of my life not interacting with Black people. Right. I saw my first Middle Eastern person when I was in middle school, and I didn't really understand any of their customs. And I didn't think of it as wrong, but I did think of it as like, that's weird. And yeah. it wasn't until I was sort of like a teenager. I was moving into uh, high school when 9-11 happened, and I was watching a lot of really strong Islamophobia happen. And at that point, I started already questioning my sexuality, and I was in the process of not quite understanding, but like in the beginning stages of that really strong depression related to my gender. And I saw all these people get super angry at anybody who came from the Middle East or anybody who practiced practiced islam and i was just like but why and they're like well they kill people and i'm like but christians have killed people for most of society we haven't attacked them at this this rate i mean heck i was 
I think I was in school when they the whole pedophilia scandals were coming up, mm-hmm. and they never received the level of anger and hatred as this like as as bad as Islamophobia had gotten when I was in high school. There was a family who owned a convenience store, and they were from India. And right after 9-11, that place got torched like three times <laughs> back to back. And that that wasn't a mistake. I know right. that wasn't a mistake. Right. That people had said, you're a little bit darker, and therefore... Sorry, it's a little cold. Um, no they said, you're a little bit darker, and therefore you are responsible for this awfulness that exude. And so I blame you personally. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. They're not even part of the culture that this happened from. Right, right. Just close with i heard them say those things and i was getting frustrated because i was just like i remember when i when i was in middle school my mom had said something that was kind of islamophobic and i remember being so upset hearing it not because of not because like i practiced practiced islam but because my mom had no idea what was part of the islamic culture and was not accurately able to compare it to anything that she had experienced and I just saw how short-sighted it was. And I wished that, I don't think that would have come out of her mouth if she had been friendly or engaged with multiple people in the culture. If we had had such, she had had just such a diverse experience, I don't think that kind of rhetoric would have come out of her mouth. And so I'm a proponent of, you know what? I don't mind that there's Christian coloring books, but then I think that Satanist coloring books should also be there. And I think that we should have conversations about queer relationships for first graders. It doesn't have to be porn, but we can say different families look different. Right. And we should talk about different types of disabilities and what they look like and why we help this person with this and not this, you know? Right. So I don't know. Big world, lots of things to work on. I can't, I definitely can't focus on all of them. Yes, indeed. Uh, so my little niche happens to be my little niche, and a lot of it comes from my own personal experience. And I think because I pass very well as male, because I'm very easy and welcoming to engage with, I think that I have the, the possibility of being able to at least promote these experiences in a way that can be more welcoming. And, and it's, again, it's super needed. One thing that I'm thinking about I think about quite a bit, actually, but now thinking about with respect to this conversation is the need for more practitioners who are (laughs) queer, male, of color, relationship diverse. Like it's Mm -hmm. for me, even as a uh, patient, it has been frustrating over the 16 years that I've been in therapy or in and out of therapy, I guess, that finding a therapist of color finding a therapist who is LGBTQ, even in New York City, is so difficult. And I I speak to people across the country, and we're lucky in New York, you know, because there is somewhat of a diversity. You go into other parts of the country, if you're a Black person in the middle of the country and you want a Black therapist, particularly, or here's one specific, a Black person in the South that wants a therapist that is not religious-based, Oof. <laughs> it's it's going to be super, super, super difficult. And I don't know what we can do to encourage more people from these communities. I mean, some of it is a, probably a financial roadblock, but mm-hmm. what can we do to encourage more people from these communities to work in the mental health field? Oh God, that one's a big one. A lot of it comes down to resources. I think I have met wonderful people who were sort of trapped by circumstances because they just didn't have the resources to do so. But I also, you know, one of the things that has sort of, for lack of a better way to say it, saved the trans community in a lot of ways has been the evolution of technology. Like I'm talking to you right now from an entirely different state Mm -hmm. and that technology has led people who are in very isolated places be able to access support in other places entirely different. So I have a number of Gen Z or Gen Alpha clients who a lot of their friend or a lot of their support come from people all over the world who are on Discord or they connect with through video games or Renaissance fairs or some kind of, some kind of convention but they stay connected through technology and that's how they are able to seek out the support that they need. It's like a pact that they're kind of working on, but it's a very slow go. I've been a proponent of people in the mental health field should be able to practice in all the states. And I'm not saying that 
not there shouldn't be certain things that need to happen for them to practice everywhere. But I hate when someone calls me from like, I had a call from someone from Tennessee. It was like, you were highly recommended. I'm dealing with my gender and sexuality. I really want to talk to you. And I'm like, I, I can't, I'm legally not allowed to, even though I have the technology to do so. And I have the background to do so. I am legally not allowed to see you if you're not in New Jersey or Massachusetts. You could be from New Jersey and travel over the state line into New York. And I can now not see you right, right. now if you're in New York. Which is silly because the skills haven't changed, not really. Some of the knowledge, yeah, like I can't tell you what happens in a name change in Tennessee, but I have a computer and I can research. You can Google that shit. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I have been hoping and crossing my fingers, especially since COVID, that they're going to create this pact that allows us to see people around the country, mostly because I'd like to be able to access people who don't have a lot of resources specifically in order to get people from communities who have very low resources into this field. I think there's got to be a combination of things from a finding ways to get them access to those resources, either through, I hate to say, because a lot of resources are based on money, but either through some kind of grant program or explain to them that those things exist in other places that they can take back to their hometowns if you want to. But also sometimes even things within the, so my best friend uh, lives in DC and is going to uh, doing a dual master's program for social work and for, I think it's like crisis management or crisis intervention. And she was in a class where almost the entire classroom said that they would not work with a transgender person. They just don't feel comfortable doing so. And I'm like, you're in social work. Good Lord. (laughs) What damn job is to be like supportive <laughs> to people. Are you kidding me? Oh no. Oh no, no, no. I was so upset hearing that. Ow. Because I get that you might not know about the culture or about what people feel like, but that ability to learn about those things is at your fingertips. It is the easiest it could be at this point. But I also feel in like the- a, an innate quality in any good social worker is the ability to empathize. There you go. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you should maybe consider another line of work. Agreed. (laughs) I I think that once upon a time, schools had this idea where they wanted to make sure they sort of pumped out the best type of their major they could. And now I think it's become more of a business. Like they're not going to tell anyone that they can't be a social worker, even if they don't quite have the qualities to be a good social worker, because they don't want to lose that kind of funding. I sure. think, but don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that I am, I would be a great social worker to work with people from certain cultures. I just don't have any basis in, but I'm not going to turn them away because they're a culture. I don't know. I'm going to let them know, listen, I have very, very little basis, but I'm willing to hear your story and talk to you about it and figure out what I could do. You know? So if someone comes to me who is, you know, I, we were just talking about Islam. If they were they were very deeply into the Islamic faith, I would be very upfront, being like, "You are absolutely welcome to come in and talk to me, and I will do the best that I can." But I also am not as knowledgeable about Islam, so you may end up teaching me some things. And if sure. you're comfortable with that, please. If not, I will do the best I can to help you find someone who knows the faith a little bit better, because. I recognize I might not know, but that doesn't mean that this person doesn't need help or to be heard. You know, I was working for a company called Jewish Family and Children's Services. Now, I'm not Jewish. I was raised Jewish, but they had a a counseling agency and they were desperate for men. They don't have a lot of men in counseling. Um, And I explained to them that I'm LGBT, that I was trans, and they were like, excuse the language, zero fucks, you're a guy, we need guys, please, for the love of God. And I was like, all right, let's do this. And it wasn't specifically Jewish people. It was a nonprofit organization that fun- the, their their morals were around Judaism and their, their funding came from a lot of Jewish faith-based nonprofits, rather. <laughs> or at least that's what it appeared to be. So I had a couple of cases with people who had these kind of horrific stories where they were like I said, very low resources, very stuck, clearly needed help, and my hands were tied in a lot of ways. Like, there's only a limit to what I could offer them. I can't live with them inside their house and make sure that they get these things, unfortunately. And 
I was talking to my supervisor about how, how upset and frustrated I was. And she said, while the resources are low right now, what you can do is you can be there with them in this hurt. Like you might be the only person who sits, sits with them in this suffering, in this hurt. And just having another person who is bearing witness and not turning away from them might be the one good thing that you could do. So you better do it with all you got. And I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like, okay. It's more important. You know, Sometimes people just need somebody to be in the room with them. It's hard because most people come to see me in their worst moments or their their most difficult moments, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of sadness. It's a lot of anger. It's a lot of hurt, betrayal, fear. And those are some of the hardest emotions to sit with another person while they're experiencing. But like that is essentially what I do. You know, boil all the other things away. What I do is I kind of sit with people and process what they're going through when they're, what they feel like at their worst, typically. Do they stay there? Not typically. I will say that I have had very few people who just kind of sat and stayed in those horrible feelings because feelings fluctuate and move. And I, I've been blessed in that a good number of them have found ways to sort of empower themselves, but not everyone, unfortunately. Some people are really stuck in their circumstances. But yeah, I, I would absolutely say that we as a society, as the entire country, should be working to provide resources to communities who are not able to access things that they need to to better themselves. So in particular, places that are very rural tend to have a really hard time getting professional services out there any type of professional services from like dentists to therapists yeah yeah it's not just mental health it's physical health as well but also like using the technology we have in the meantime so that people can access care even when they're in the middle of nowhere i think is helpful as well agreed Um, So I don't know. That's a multi-step plan to get other communities to be able to enter the field of mental health. That will be a challenge in itself. (laughs) Yeah. You had mentioned that you deal with a lot of people in very uh, um, complicated emotional states. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of sadness, a lot of depression. That's what social workers, therapists, you know, people who work in the mental health field do. How do you not take that home? Sometimes I do, unfortunately. Um, a lot of what they teach you in your graduate level work is they they kind of push this narrative of self care, but they don't really explain what that is. What it, it is, kind yes. of, it can kind of look like anything. If I was going to redefine it now, uh, having been in the field for so long, I would say self care is taking time, taking a moment, like a almost meditating on where you are at mentally, emotionally, physically, checking in with your emotions, checking in with your body, assessing where you're at, and then figuring out from there what you need to manage and to be back at your center, to be back at your grounded state. Sometimes that means I need to go outside and work out and take a walk or take a run. Sometimes that means I need to sit on my couch and eat Cheetos. I hate to say it that (laughs) way, but... (laughs) Ain't nothing wrong with that in moderation. In moderation, of course. But giving myself permission to be human and sometimes it's pushing myself to take care of myself better. If that means that I've been feeling sluggish because I've been drinking a lot of sugary carbonated drinks, maybe that means I need to focus on doing more water for the next week so that I can get myself back to baseline. If it means that I've been really hard on myself and trying to keep myself to a standard that's unreasonable, maybe that means just playing video games and letting myself let some of those things fall away. And that's hard. It's hard to talk about because it could be so many different things, but a lot of it is about checking in with your needs and taking care of yourself in this process because like i said we deal with some really hard very difficult stories i feel like i'm kind of like you in a different way i'm sort of the carrier of a lot of stories and Mm -hmm. a lot of my tends to be a lot of people's pain but sometimes it's magic sometimes it's wonder sometimes it's a hero story a hero journey that I'm, i'm holding but i carry so many stories with me all the time that sometimes i sort of like lose myself and i have to 
make sure or prioritize time to take care of myself so that I can be the best social worker later on. I think that's super important. And I think it's a good lesson for even people who don't do this for a living to kind of be able to have some sort of separation and take some time for yourself. And if you're anything like me, you feel guilty sometimes about doing mindless stuff or what would be considered mindless stuff and catch myself there. But it's also important to do that. Like you need to turn off or at least change the channel sometimes. Oh yeah. I, I remember with my own therapist, cause I go to therapy as well. I remember sitting down and talking about how it feels like I, I can't turn off the social work self, right? Mm-hmm. I'm constantly turned on. And she's just like, you're going to burn out. You cannot be on all the time. That's ideal. That's wonderful. I love that you love everyone. You need to stop and take care of yourself. You should be able to turn to that care in towards yourself as well on, on some occasions. So, you know, without trying to sound super cheesy, a lot of that happens to be a lot of playful inner child stuff. Uh, I'll, a lot of my creative things are doing that inner child things that I've always wanted or wanted to see. So it's a lot of video games, a lot of weird video games, or sewing little demon stuffies, or spending time just sitting reading books that I've been interested in, or painting, even if I'm not good at it, because it's fun, because I like it. (laughs) Uh, Kind of, I do a lot of messing around with art as a way to sort of cleanse, but also you know, get back in touch with myself. I find that very helpful. And throughout my life, not in the as concrete as my transition, but redefining myself has been a thing that's happened throughout my life in different ways. You know, there's a story I've been dying to say, but it sort of hasn't fit really well into any of our conversation yet. Okay. Um, Let's hear it. So early, so I started transitioning in, transitioning medically in 2009 that's when i started testosterone and the the way they give testosterone out back then is different how they do now like what they did is they give you the max dose and then wean you down if they needed to now they give you the least dose and they wean you up as they need to okay. and they found that they have better results that way so that means that through college through my undergraduate years i was going through puberty a second time for funsies <laughs> you know and i make a lot of jokes about it because you know I didn't understand why guys acted the way they acted in high school. And then I had a lot more respect when I was in college to go through it myself. Yep. And I do some public speaking things and I talk about how, man, one of the suckiest parts about male puberty is the dial has been ripped off and it's on your, your hoardiness, basically. That was a really, really hard thing to manage as a single college student trying to work and trying to get good grades. And then all of a sudden, just in the middle of the day being like, oh my God, I cannot get my mind off of this thing. And I, it's uncomfortable actually. And I make a joke, even light sockets were starting to look sexy. It was bad. (laughs) So I get through about a year and a half to two years into testosterone, I'm starting to pass. I've already been binding for a couple of years. I don't have top surgery until 2016 and I've already graduated colleges and stuff. But so I'm starting to pass and I get into this phase. I don't even realize I get into it, but I get into this like hyper masculine phase and it's hindsight being 2020 looking back, I realized that there was this innate fear that because I had not been born male, that I was not accustomed to male ways of doing things, male ways of communicating, male ways of interacting, that I was constantly felt like people can see that I'm not really male, that I'm this imposter. Right. So I'm hyper-masculine. And to me, what that meant is I don't do anything that's like super, I want to say like, like self carry I don't really worry about my appearance as much or as strongly. So like doing your nails is a girl thing and, and plucking your eyebrows is a girl thing. And I have a little bit of a breakdown. And my friend who's doing the dual masters, I went to her house in the middle of the night, kind of like hysterical, like a panic attack, being like, I'm still... But I'm starting to get a unibrow and I don't really know what to do because I, I don't know how guys handle this at all. And I used to go get on wax, but I don't see guys going to get wax. What do they do? And she comes from a very Italian family. So she basically like bops me upside the head and she's like, you idiot. <laughs> she has two younger brothers. And she's like, my brothers, they, they pluck their eyebrows. They cut their nails. They even like, what is that? 
I want to say sand, but that's wrong. But, uh, yeah. uh, buff, uh, yeah. uh, uh, why am I using the word too? File. <laughs> file, that's it. Yes. They file them down as well. And she's like, and honesty, if if you want to go get your eyebrows waxed, go get your eyebrows waxed. She's like, you didn't work this hard to put yourself in a box on the other side of the spectrum. You're supposed to be yourself. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, oh, fuck, I'm supposed to be myself. <laughs> What does that look like? What am I? Ooh. And so there was a couple weird, like, gendered things I recognized and started to, I don't want to say play with, but play with. It occurred to me. So, you know, in my early part of my transition, I was perceived a lot as being gay because of, I would assume, the tone of my voice and my hand movements and the way I did things. But it was frequent that gay men would be like, hey, and I was just like, not what you think I am. Oh. <laughs> you know, like, figure guns. <laughs> right, right. And uh, a lot of that that I was kind of going through earlier on. So I'm hyper aware of certain gender things that I think most people are unaware with. Um, so graduate college, my very, very first job, I'm working for the state of New Jersey doing child protective services. Um, I do that for two years because I was part of a grant program. While I was there, he's unfortunately passed away, but one of my all-time favorite bosses was this guy. He was a very large gay black man, and we would talk (laughs) frequently about gender and sexuality. And I I think I used to blow his mind all the time because I would bring up things he would just never think of. Like, I think the easiest one for me to acknowledge is that I don't talk like men talk, typically. Like, my voice is always, like, when I meet new people... And when I answer the phone, my voice automatically raises an octave. It's sort of innate. And it's something that I was, I don't even say unfortunate because I don't hate it, but I was unofficially taught to do as a young girl. You know, I emulated the females in my family. My dad was mostly working and I didn't really see him. Not that he didn't live in the household, but he was either working or kind of watching baseball. So we didn't interact a whole heck of a lot. So I spent a lot of time with my aunts and my mom. And so whenever they welcome someone in the door, whenever they answer the phone, they'd be like, oh my God, hi, blah, 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 blah. Immediately raises the volume up in an octave, right? And I had noticed at this point that men don't do that. They kind of keep this very kind of low, I don't want to say monotone, but this kind of like low voice. It's almost like they never get excited, right? right. There's not a, lot of in- <laughs> not a lot of inflection. And I brought this to his attention and he just started paying attention. He's like, Oh my god, I've noticed it. It's it's everywhere <laughs> now. I notice it. Like I notice that my voice doesn't doesn't do this inflection at all and that you do it. He's like, Are you working to train this out? And I thought about it for a while. I was like, I I still to this day will get misgendered on the phone. I have been called Carmen frequently, <laughs> which is fine. But I mean that's maybe, also a unisex name. That's true. Yeah. People will often will hear me and think that I'm more feminine. And probably earlier in my transition, it would have very much bothered me, but now it doesn't. And the reason I don't adjust it is because it kind of works. My raised tone, whether it was intentional or not, does create a welcome sense for the people I interact with so far. Right. Bringing people into a therapy room is hard and making sure that they feel welcome to be there and excited that I'm excited that they're there makes that transition a little easier for them. And so this is a piece of me that I didn't work on, but that's, that's me. So I have clients who get a little anxious that they're like, this is a thing that I don't like. And I'm like, okay, well then you get to work on that. I, there were things I did work on. I had to have someone teach me how to grow and groom and shave a beard because I learned that in college from Honestly, from trans women who are no longer using the knowledge. They're like, let me teach you the ways. Right, right. <laughs> um, let's, let's do a little exchange here. I, Because at the time, oh my God, when I first got testosterone, I went immediately to the store. I bought all kinds of razors and aftershave and things. And I'm so excited for the first day. And a lot of the trans women are like, oh, honey, aftershave is not really a thing we use anymore. That's like your grandfather. Thing. Yeah, it's a dad. So like, it's a dad thing. And I'm like, it burns like a mother. I didn't even like it. And they're like, well, there's a reason, but we don't have to use that anymore. Here's what we're going to use now. Yeah. Um, and learning about like, you know, how to shave, how to take care of facial hair. There's weird instances you just don't anticipate. Like as a girl, 
going swimming, there's a feeling you get when you have your, your hair is flowing through the water. There's like a tug to it. I did not anticipate that feeling on my face. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's such a weird experience. And it makes me laugh because so a little bit south of me in Asbury Park, there's a couple different queer organizations. And one of them is the Man Mermaid group. They do calendars and such. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's an iconic, but they have this symbol or they had this symbol where it was like, you know, they have a little mermaid where she flips her hair back and there's just like this circle of water. They have that, but it's with a beard. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, so there was a lot of parts of transition that sort of went untalked about. There was things like losses that I didn't. I sort of lost the lesbian community. I'm not angry at them or any way, shape or form, but as I transitioned and no longer was perceived or looked like a lesbian person, I was really no longer welcome into those spaces. And it's totally fair and totally right to do that. And it still sucked at the same time. Get it? Yeah. You know, there were things that I had to relearn how to do. Like as a mediumly attractive female, I never really had to learn to deal with flirting or rejection the way that men have to. And that was that was probably the hardest process for me to learn, honestly. And I, I grew up in a lovely time to be trans because there is a lot more people who are comfortable dating or being around or talking to trans people. So I'm very grateful for that in mm-hmm. a lot of ways, but it doesn't make that that journey any harder. It's still very, very difficult to learn how to engage with people in this entirely new way and also sometimes manage their fears when i was in that undergraduate program when i was at the place where i was passing there was a girl in the class who apparently had a crush on me and then found out that i was trans and had a little bit of a breakdown that i had to move her through i was not interested in her but apparently she found me very attractive and then when she found out that she was trans she was just like does this mean i'm gay it's like no <laughs> No, that, that education you, piece still has to happen. Trans men are men, trans women are women. And it, it's funny because there are components of it where listen, when I'm being sexual, when I'm naked with my, my partner or my girlfriend, because I have a, a non-binary partner and a girlfriend who both live with me, there is a moment of when we first started being romantic or sexual, are they going to not be comfortable with my body? How are they going to handle the fact that I don't have this one appendage? You know, are they going to be okay with, I had top surgery. There's a scar that goes across my chest. I don't really feel my nipples. There are components of this that are very different. And there's something that I weirdly realized, which is that I don't know too many people who are super comfortable with their naked body. It doesn't really (laughs) matter if you're trans, something. That is absolutely 100% true. (laughs) Body positivity and body shame is something that is a very recurring topic uh, on this podcast. And one of the nice things I think about being trans and having seen both sides, you know, oh, 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 one, one more. So at the time I told you I was a smoker, I'm no longer a smoker. And there was one night where it was late at night. It was raining. It was dark. I was in a hoodie and I like, I pulled it up and I'm running into a Seven Eleven from this alley where I've parked into the Seven Eleven, And there's a lady who's coming out and she looked up and it was just like sheer terror on her face. I have never evoked terror in anyone. I am the big, soft, like cuddly, like bear basically person. So her being terrified of me was like a slap in the face. And I had to process it for a while. And I realized Oh my God, I'm that horror scene. I'm that, the guy who's in a black hoodie running in from an alleyway in the dark, in the night when no one's around. And I had to realize that I had to be very, very careful about the way I interacted with women and where I placed myself. And it was funny because I still had that mentality in my brain. Like I still go to bars and keep my hand over my drink. Like someone's going to roofie me, which is highly (laughs) unlikely at this point. I did. It can happen in any formulation. But it was sort of a mindfuck where I was like, oh my God, I'm now in that place where yeah. I have to be careful about you know, how I interact with women because I could be misrepresented, perceived. And there was a moment in time where I was a little sad, where I was just like, when they talk about all men, X, Y, and Z, I'm now part of that statistic. And there was a lot of 
a lot of defensiveness that came up a lot because I had worked so hard to be perceived as a guy and now being perceived as a bad guy was very scary and uh, right. hard. And there was a brief moment of enlightenment that happened where it's like, because I live in a place of privilege, because I'm medium attractive, I'm perceived white, I speak well, I'm educated, all these things. I now have the capacity to give voice to things that maybe didn't have the voice. I can now, when people are like, Cameron, what do you think? I could be like, I don't think I'm educated. Maybe we should talk to so-and-so that you've been ignoring this entire time. I, I can essentially direct conversation to things that are important. And things like B2 weren't specifically talking about me because I'm very conscious of these things, but they were talking about the state of men and the way we interact with other men, you know, and how we need to call them out when they do bullshit you know that's a little harder for me because like i said uh, while i perceive myself as a man i i have a hard time with male culture because i didn't grow up in it but at the same time it is it is part of our duty in terms of this gender inequality that exists is to use that privilege and use that power that we do have to evoke the change that needs to happen to protect the communities that are more at risk. Yeah. So yeah, I'm trans. Yes, I'm a minority community, but I'm not the person that is in danger. It's not me. It's trans women. It's trans black women. It's it's trans black women without resources. They're the ones who are being killed. I might have been scared, but it wasn't going to happen to me. It was never going to happen to me. It was always going to be the women who are from other ethnic backgrounds who don't have resources. It was poor poor trans people it was homeless people it was it was a lot of other communities and weird bless like my blessing of not having people turn away having these privileges being able to go to college is really a calling for me to make sure that the people who don't have access to those things have access to those, access to the the resources and the safety that they need for their own growth Thank you, Cameron, for speaking so eloquently and thoughtfully. And thank you for the work that you do. Uh, you know, we talked even within the episode about not having enough mental health practitioners who are men, um, not having enough mental health practitioners who are part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And um, Cameron is both. And uh, we need more of you. And uh, I just appreciate so much what you do and uh, also what you bring to the table uh, your experience as a trans person, uh, you know, your coming out, everything that you talked about was so on point, and uh, I'm grateful that you reached out to me to be on the show. Uh, for the folks listening, uh, you can find Cameron on Psychology Today if you are in New Jersey and you are looking for a therapist uh, without directly having engaged with Cameron Services. I think I'm in a pretty good uh, 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 I think I have a pretty good idea to recommend him if uh, needed. And like most psychologists and therapists, uh, Cameron does not have any publicly available social media pages. I have tried to befriend my therapists on social media, and that generally does not work. And it's probably just not a good idea. So uh, thanks again, Cameron, for being on the show. And I hope you come back. Thank you for listening to Detoxicity. I hope you found this particular episode interesting. And if you are new, I hope you go back and listen to all of the older episodes. Uh, once again, my name is Mike Joseph. I am the host and producer of this show. And uh, there are a lot of things that you can do to continue to support our mission, continue to support this podcast. Uh, follow me on social media. I am on Instagram, Twitter, and I'm on TikTok as Detox Pod Guy. Uh, you can also send me an email if you'd like. I'm at detoxpod at gmail.com. I am always on the hunt for people with interesting, inspirational, and powerful stories. So if you know somebody who fits that bill or if you yourself fit that bill, please don't hesitate to drop me a line via email or via social media. Uh, please make sure you subscribe on your podcast platform that you're listening to this on. Uh, rate, comment, help a brother out, uh, help us move up in the rankings, uh, follow me on social media, like I said, uh, follow our Patreon, or subscribe to my Patreon, actually, patreon.com slash detoxicitypod, you get access to exclusive episodes, you get episodes a little earlier than the general public, you get a cool-ass sticker, lots of stuff, once again, patreon.com slash detoxicitypod, quick shout-out to Calvin Williams for providing the music, and, uh, 
doing his magic on the logo, which was originally designed by Jacob Block. I thank you all for listening. I wish you all the best. Please take care of each other. Till next time, peace. Peace.